Michael is the author of a brand new book, and I'm going to throw it up here, The Inner Voice of Trading. And I said to Michael before we came on air that, and I don't say this often, I've, I've, you know, I've got a shelf of thousand trading books and uh, mental books, self-help books, etc. And I would say to anybody that wants to get into this business, Michael, hands down, read this book first before you get into anything technical or fundamental on the trading side. Uh, the most important six inches, I think, in trading is between your ears. Uh, I didn't make that up. It's a combination of various people's uh, saying. But, Michael, thanks for coming on. Thanks for writing the book. And uh, appreciate it. Matt, you're too kind. Uh, you know, after playing basketball together, uh, the, the Nigerian uh, former soccer goalie star, Manute Ball, named his first child Chris Mullen Ball. And likewise, for that generous comment, I'm going to call my my first daughter, hopefully, Matt, Matt Davio Martin. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be Hayes for the rest of her life, the poor woman. <laughs> and I'm single, so I don't even know when that's going to happen, but... <laughs> I thought I'd throw it out there. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for so, having me. So, you know, uh, again, th this is not a this is not a typical trading book with a ton of uh, words in between. You, you've really condensed, again, fantastically. You know, what is it? 180 pages. You'll like yeah. you like you told me when you sent me a copy. You're going to breeze through it, and I did. I loved it. And, you know, I, I think everybody gets what they want out of the market. Again, I don't know who said that, but um, I, I believe that's true. And, um, you know, give us a little background and a little uh, biography, if you will, on, on how you got to where you are today and, and how you came to write this book. Okay, so, you know, I'm a working class kid. I grew up having my own company. I used to landscape, I used to caddy golf bags, uh, you know, weight tables and stuff. And I just knew that, you know, there's nothing wrong with working a hard day's work for a good day's pay and all that. But I knew I wanted to eventually use my brain. Eventually ended up at Columbia. And um, as just fate would have it, I ended up working in facilities management where they are concerned with all the expenses that go on with running the school. Now, what a lot of folks might not know is that Columbia University is the third largest landlord in all of Manhattan outside the Catholic Church and the city proper. Oh, I, thought it, I, thought it was, I thought it was still second, but I guess the city took over there on, on the second spot. Well, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. So back when I was in school, they were number three. They okay. could be up or down. Since then, the Catholic Church hasn't exactly, you know, <laughs> hidden the cover off the ball. And no. so... Um, Nonetheless, they're very sensitive to heat and oil, or fuel oil too, whatever you want to call it, and natural gas prices. And believe it or not, for being a big user of the commodity, they didn't even have any, you know, buy hedging programs. So here I am in this almost, it's not work study, it was a little bit advanced, but um, it was a bit of a work study program. And I found myself using Lotus 123 and getting rows of data from the NYMEX and looking at and creating seasonal models, you know, see if I could find anything to see if the school would implement it. And it occurred to me that, like stock trading, there is a bit of a zero-sum aspect to it. So if the hedges work, it's got to come from somebody else. Went to Wall Street, became a retail grunt. Of course, they were only concerned with three things, new accounts, net new assets, and gross commissions, because there weren't really – it wasn't a big fee business, and it was still commissions. And I just thought that was the most retarded way to, to judge people, but that's the business model. It's a sales and marketing job. No one at a retail joint is a money manager. They can say they're, they're money managers, but I was a sales manager. I was a training manager. I've written questions for the Series 7. There is nothing about any of that that's concerned with performance and, most, most importantly, low drawdowns. So lo and behold, I go out on my own, become a CTA. I do very, very well. Um, Moved to Los Angeles, and not too short after being here, I got Ed Sakota's email. Email him. We strike up a friendship. I join the Incline Village Training Tribe, and I fly up there two, two and a half years every other week, uh, straight without missing all but one. Actually, I was I was chairing a golf tournament, and I wouldn't have been able to get back the next Friday. But for two and a half years, every other week when there was a tribe meeting, I was up there, and. Um, so give us a little uh, taste of this because most people in this business for, you know, as long as you and I have been, 20 years, have read about Ed Sequoia in, in the uh, tribe, and you had mm -hmm. firsthand knowledge. So that took place up there in Tahoe. Give us a little history and flavor of what that was like, you know, from, uh, you know, from your first uh, meetings, uh, you know, until you'd been there for a couple years, obviously. Well, so, you know, anyone who reads Market Wizards, the first book, 
has to has to come to that chapter because Ed is also mentioned, I think, in two other chapters in um I think he's mentioned for sure in Marcus's chapter and then in one other one, I can't remember off the top of my head. Anyway, you know, it was a little nerve wracking at first because he was so deep and, and he's a very intuitive guy, right? So he can absolutely look at I think Jack mentioned something about his watch being fifteen minutes fast. Ed's the kind of guy who will look at you be very intuitive. He'll be able to see um, into your personality, how you behave, how you hold yourself, because your body language gives a lot away. I mean, he's not a guy that you'd want to play. To my knowledge, he doesn't play poker, but he's not a guy that you'd want to play poker with because he's terribly insightful. And that might run against the grain of what you know or what you've heard of him of being a big systems guy, is that in my mind's eye, if you ever wanted to be a discretionary trader, look out. He would murder it because right. he's so he's so smart. I'll, I'll say this about Ed in that. If everyone thinks of Ed as being, you know, old turkey, you know, um, and, and a rem, you know, he's a renaissance guy, right? He's very, he's very, very smart. He's very intellectual. He still has a child's precocity about learning things. But knowing him as a person, I will share with you that his kindness and generosity, at least directed toward me, was many, many magnitudes far beyond his intellect. And when you think about that, it's a very scary proposition. Well, you know, you know, this is, I think, getting to the root of kind of your, you, the theme of your book, which is you, you, you get what you give, and you give what you get, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, not to get all Oprah on everybody, but this is the first trading book where I, you know, I really feel like I can, uh, uh, I, I agree with. I mean, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of smart people in the world. There's a lot of people that can figure out how to trade. Uh, right, yep. technically um, or fundamentally, either way. But when you get down to it, you still have to uh, respect what's inside your own head and, and what type of person you are. And uh, right. I think that's way more important. And I've done a lot of training outside of trading, technically, or reading books and these types of things. Uh, there's, you know, there's a number number of products that get in, you know, get into touch with who you are. Um, and that's constant work. It's not something that you do and it's over. I mean, it's it's a lifetime process, and I think you would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, you have an emotional system. The light bulb hit me like two months into the tribe is that, sure, you have a rules-based system. You might be a reversal guy like Bill Dunn or John W. Henry, or maybe you're just a breakout guy and you're going to enter from break with breakouts or moving average crossovers. That's all the technical side of life, but what you really find out is that your emotional system is what runs your overall operation, and that includes you as a human. Traders are humans first. They're traders second. And you could walk around with a puffy chest and be like, dude, I'm all over Coco, and no one really cares about that. That's all macho man and bravado, and sooner or later, if you have the flip side of the emotional coin of being macho man or bravado is humility. And I get into that in the book with the rogues, right? Those were guys who walked around like they were all driving Bentleys and stuff, but they sucked as traders. I mean, I could trade any of those rogue guys under the table, not because I have a superior technical system, but I'm much more self-aware than Jerome Curville or Lee Sin or the Hunter right. at Amaran. Which, you know, I mean, uh, what kind of moron puts 65 percent of the firm's margin in one trade? Right. Yeah. Totally. You know, and, and that's what it comes, you know, but you talk about this. You know, I, I always say this. There is there is a fine balance, right? I, I think you have to have a little bit of ego to put on a trade, but you have to have less ego to take it off or, or you know, take the risk, I, I think is what I mean by that. You know, you have to be able to say that's where I'm going to be out. So you have to have, and I may, may not be saying this in your words. These are just my words. I think you have to have a little, little sack on the line to put on a trade, but you have to have uh, less sack with the process of losing and, and eliminating that ego when you lose and saying, that's okay, it's part of the game, and I'm going to do it again next time, put that same trade on again. Matt, I think you're dead on. I mean, I'm only going to parrot what you just said. I think surrender is not something that guys do well. You know, they're not built for surrender. They always feel like quitters never win and winners never quit. But I'll tell you, quitters who stop out their equity and are willing to transfer the risk at their stop to another trader are the folks who go home with a clear head and more equity typically in their accounts. Um, there's lots of ways that I embraced surrender myself. Um, which being an alpha type does not necessarily feel good physically. It's something that you have to get used to. Right. But what you understand is that there's really no one trade that's going to make your career at least ex ante because you don't know. You're not smart enough, despite how smart you might think you are. 
I'm not smart enough to know what trades are going to make my year. It, one year in 04, it was sugar. Right. I had 75 percent of my margin in sugar from six to 21. Right. And I had no idea ahead of time. But I, sure, I can assure you I got killed in beans. It was almost like I'd get in the beans and get knocked out. I'd get in the beans and get knocked out. I'd get in the, I remember sitting next to Ed saying, geez, Ed, this isn't working so well. You know? <laughs> I don't feel so good in my body yeah. with these trades knocking me out. Um, but you have to focus on the process, not the outcome of any one particular trade. And self-aware traders realize that, that any one trading day doesn't really matter. Right. But ultimately, if you don't manage your risk, it manages you. And the trade that defines your career would unfortunately be the Widowmaker and natural gas like it did Hunter. It'll be, right. you know, whatever. And, you know, so, so be it. So you have to surrender. And if you have an ego, sooner or later, those guys get out. You know, they get taken outside and, and beaten. Yeah. And shot and, and bludgeoned and kicked and, and everything Old else. Yeller. Yeah, you have to, exactly. You have to put the dog down. But, you know, you, so you bring up a good point, surrendering and uh, the ego and, and, and giving up the, you know, I, I, I think I say this all the time to students that I have is that losing is absolutely part of the game. And, you know, uh, as you said, you know, where are my trades going to come from? I look at, you know, coffee this year and I've had two huge counter trend trades and coffee this year and like you said i would have never predicted it was just the way my systems work and they came in this year and they were great but i'm not sitting there you know beating the drum going i'm smart because I, I like you said i had no idea it was going to come and where it was going to come from and in the spring you know, it was the same thing you had some kind of kind of these last blow-offs on a lot of these different commodities but you just never know where they're going to come from but what i do know about markets is opportunities always come again. And, and I think that's what's allowed me to work towards surrendering more and more and, you know, allowing those losses to happen and being comfortable in that uncomfortableness. It's, it, it is never for me, or at least again, in my, in, in this stage doing this 20 plus years, it's never comfortable losing, but I know that the next day there's another opportunity or two or three or four. And that is the thing that drives me, I guess, is that, I am not. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's it's not about me it, 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 at all, and, and that's the toughest part. So, um, you know, twenty years. Wh where where do you think, like you said, you know, where do you think you started separating your ego from you know your performance and and really letting that happen and be. So when I started trading as a CTA, well, first of all, I want to say nice job with those coffee trades, you SOB, because I got I was on the other side of them. <laughs> so kudos to you for being able to capture those counter trend moves um, on that side of it. Um, in terms of when did I realize? So when you're a hedger, you know what the physical amount is that you need to hedge because it's what your needs are, right? So you buy forward in the in the in the market to offset the price spikes. Right. But when you're a speculator, you don't need any of the inventory. So position sizing, you come to learn very very quickly, is the name of the game. That's where you make and lose your money. It's not the entries, it's not the exits, but how much you have. Now I write in the book that you know when you look at the demise of empires or hedge funds, leverage and use of leverage is at the heart of every meltdown. Right no way around it. So if you want to be high frequency trader, you want to be long term capital and lever gigantic sums of capital to make nickels and dimes, you know, knock yourself out. But that's like smoking cigarettes at the gas station. <laughs> I, love first, that. I love that in, quote, by the way. I was going to ask you about that one because I, I agree with you. I mean, but you, you, you have to, you know, you have to ha have an understanding of, uh, you know, your nominal uh, portfolio that you're trading. Let me ask you, you know, with that in mind, do you, do you, did you come to a number that you were comfortable with your personality as far as, uh, you know, total risk or dollar risk or percentage risk? Yeah, and I, I'm not unaware that I didn't answer the other question. It was when. Sorry like I was good. I have a good natural ability to trade. I just have the emotional temperament to handle risk. I don't freak out. If I wasn't a trader, I'm sure I'd be an emergency room surgeon or a 9-11 right. operator. That's just how I'm built. Right. And it doesn't make me better than anybody. It just that's my emotional constitution. You know, that's where I end up, you know. So for me, I got tired of ramping my equity up three, four hundred percent, but then giving half of it back. I said, there's got to be a better way. So how can I have that ratio of performance, but keep it to a point where, you know, I don't get agita, as we say in New York or whatever, and want to jump out the window. Um, and I realized that the only way I can do that is if I have a trade-off between my, the emotional feelings that I have on the upside 
with the drawdown. And then you start to conjugate your system with the drawdowns that you can withstand. You know, I'm not trading commodities or anything for that matter to make 12% a year. I mean, why bother? I can get high yield debt to do that and sleep at night. I'm trading, you know, to do like, you know, my mentors did, you know, Marcus and Ed to, you know, make a couple hundred percent a year. Otherwise, why bother? Why go through all this for 12% a year? It's not what I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking for pension money. I'm looking to, you know, build my own portfolio. Um, and so then you make those trade-offs and then you have to conjugate your system with your, you know, that's the whole point of Ed's, what I think is Ed's most important quote in Market Wizards. And it's what I start the book with is that the goal is, is for a system to develop a system with which they're compatible, not necessarily the one that's the most profitable or the one that has the least amount of drawdowns. You can certainly play poker with your track record if you want to go out and raise public money, pension money. You know, I help people, you probably do, you know, build systems that hypothetically and then eventually in practice will play well to the David Swenson's of the world. I'm not in that business. I don't care what Swenson thinks of me. So I'm really looking to trade my own money for my own financial and emotional benefit. Right. And, you know, one of the things that you talk about in your book and uh, I want to ask you a little bit about is that you're able to do and separate yourself from is noise. What would you know? How yeah. would you define noise? Because there's always been noise for traders, uh, probably no more than anywhere in any other time. But there's a lot of different ways that noise comes to us, whether it's Twitter, stock tweets, uh, CNBC, you know, yeah. Bloomberg, financial TV, et cetera, yada yada. So right. you know, how how do you define noise as a, uh, you know from your trading turret? And um, you know, give us a little a little background there. I think it's a really insightful question, actually, as deceptively easy as it as it might appear in the in written word. You know, I have friends in all the media, and they are teachers to me on some level. But I think the way I d differentiate between what's noise and what's you know people consider like signal is my own sense of self trust. Amateur traders and, and rookies who are just starting don't know how to separate the wheat from the shaft, so to speak. Am I still there? Yeah, you're still here. All right, my video's not moving, but I'm still here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, I trust myself enough to not necessarily care what John Paulson, Jimmy Rogers are, are saying on TV. It's uh, irrelevant to me. I'm right. doing my own thing, and I have – my own sense of self-awareness, and I'm connected with the rules that I know how to uh, deploy tactically to run money. Right. And so I have enormous respect for them. And so I don't use the word noise as a derogatory expression, as you kind of hear it a lot um, used in the media. I just know that that to me is infotainment. It's interesting. I definitely learn a lot. I'm a voracious reader. Right. Um, but to that point... I'm watching Yankee games on MLB.tv. I don't have a cable subscription or a satellite dish subscription, uh, and I haven't had that in, you know, going on. It'll be five years this March. It's interesting. It sounds like you, you and I turned it off around the same time. I turned off uh, all uh, outside TV subscription, as right. you said, TV, cable, satellite, et cetera, in oh, mid-06. And it's been the best thing that I've ever done in my life, and that was, you know, again, 15 years into me doing this. Um, Wow. And I think a lot, I think, you know, so I want to ask you, you know, you go back to kind of, uh, you know, this noise and I, I view it as favorable, but I've been doing it for a long time as you have. So now we can discern what is important noise and what is less important noise and infotainment. I like that. Um, you know, as Malcolm Gladwell says in Outliers, what is it, 10,000 hours uh, to become proficient in anything. Right. Obviously, we've put in our time and, and, and this is another thing, you know, that that gut, that intuition has to be built by filtering this said noise that we're talking about. So how does someone like yourself uh, manage uh, the noise? Well, you know, I pick and choose my spots. Um, I use Twitter. I use stock twits. I use – I still subscribe to, you know – 40 or so different blogs and sites that I get the syndicated feeds because I still find it very easy to kind of have the Internet come to me. Right. Um, I think what Howard's done at StockTwits is brilliant. Yep. A lot of great people there to learn from. Um, I read a lot of books. 
And I'm also very, you know, self-aware. You know, I meditate every day. I go to yoga a couple times a week, you know, because that works for me, keeps me grounded. Yep. And I find the more I sit in silence, the better I become as a person, um, which helps my trading. Because I don't really live to trade. The trading talent, like Ed would say, the trading talent has me. Um, it's part of who I am. It's part of my, my life process. Yeah. Um, you know, I was born to do this. I was built to do this. And, you know, not to get all granola on you, but I also give an enormous amount of money away yeah. um, to help other people. I mean, enormous is, is a relative term. I give a significant number uh, away where I know I know what the number is. Um, so I'm not this type of a savage capitalist who's just in it to make money the way the media would portray Wall Street. I'm in it to make money because there's a purpose behind it. You know, there's, yeah, there's, so th there's, this, you're, you're touching on a subject that I was going to ask you directly about, so I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, you, you don't seem like the uh, you know portrayed trader, I, although I don't think many traders have been portrayed well in movies or written books, with the exception of Trading Places and Eddie Murphy. You know, Eddie Murphy was the, probably the best trader I ever saw on on big screen. And, and because because he came from uh, kind of similar roots uh, that you and I did. I used to caddy. I used to have a paper route and cut lawns also. And uh, I learned more about emotion and people skills doing those jobs probably than any other work I did. And what I and mean you learn how to is, treat people too. I learned how to treat people. I learned doesn't matter whether you're the the janitor of the company or the CEO. You're all from the same metal and ultimately and and. Um, but the respect, uh, you know, ultimately comes down to price in a market also. And you talk about that in your book. Uh, price doesn't care uh, what your position is. And, uh, you know, as time has come by for me and, and I've come to my own methods, really, I need nothing more than price. I'm sure you're the same way in a, in a couple maybe uh, moving averages. And I can I can trade and I can trade anything. Price, liquidity and uh, let's say a, a volume. That's all I need. And um so where I'm going with this question is, do you think do you think those those early occupations, as you said, I was made to trade? Did you know? I mean, I didn't know it. Probably I, I worked, you know, in a few other industries uh, before I became a full time trader, whereas you kind of fell into it at a point in your life while you were a student and fell into a career. When you were at Columbia, did you think you were going to be in, on Wall Street? I. Yeah, I mean, I went to Columbia because I wanted to study with a bunch of guys who I got to study with and who were very important to me, um, just in terms of opening my head. Yeah. But surprisingly, once I I took the classes with them, I really had no use for Columbia. And I know that sounds horrible, but I, I was I was aware that you know I needed Columbia more than it needed me. Um, I had spent two years at Westchester Community College in um, in Valhalla, New York, which was to me the best school ever. And you don't really get a lot of personalized attention at an Ivy League school because they are aware of what they are and who they are. So, um, you know, Robert Mundell was a great guy. He was as just down to earth as possibly could be. He'd walk across college, walk with the guy, and he'd be there with his Western Canadian accent. <clears throat> Jack Bhagwati was so funny. Um, Kelvin Lancaster, Edmund Phelps, Phil Kagan, the hyperinflation guru. I mean, these guys all shaped my thinking. But to my knowledge, they can't trade at all. Right, right. Um, and I knew that I wanted unlimited upside. I knew that working in a pay scale or some kind of organization where your cap, you know, your your annual salary is capped, and or you have to put in 10, 20, 30 years to have some type of retirement, that was not going to work for me. I am a tough dog to keep on the porch, and as you can imagine, with my temperament, although I'm very grounded and spiritual. I'm a tough employee to have because I've got my own ideas. I never really had a boss who I trusted. I never had a boss who I looked up to and said, God, I want to be like you. Most of them I had great contempt for, mostly because they were—they seemed to be like what seniors in high school seem to you when you're a freshman. Right. They're right. just there three years before you. That's it. There's yeah. nothing really mo more cool about them. And so I just wanted to find a job where if I worked as so hard as I, as I possibly could and I did the quality work and I did the quantity of work, that I would get, I would get uh, remunerated for my efforts, and I could also be self-employed. Um, and so, yes, the answer in a long-winded way is that I totally wanted to do my own thing and be my own guy and somehow find my way onto the street. But that was the time when having an MBA was 
you know, the cat's meow. And no one was really interested in an undergrad, right. you know, from a good school, uh, whatever. So I took a job as a marketing grunt, you know, as a stockbroker, financial advisor, just because I wanted to get in the game. And then after literally three years and three months or so, I, I finally had enough assets of client assets and a track record with those people where I called, you know, 15 of my top clients and I said, I'm starting my own company. And they're all like, well, good. Just make sure you send me the, the ACATs. Right. And I said, fine. Um, going back, to, uh, I got to touch on the subject because you talked about it in two ways. Uh, caddying. Mm -hmm. did, did you learn more from caddying from the uh, corporate CEO male titans or did you learn more from their wives? You know, this is going to be a great question. It's probably one that you'll have a couple of follow-ups to because when I caddied, I caddied in uh, Westchester County, New York at Quaker Ridge and across the street at Wingfoot. Okay. So um, despite what's written about John Merriweather, when I caddied for him at Wingfoot, just which was coincidence, this is long before long-term capital, you know, he's a great guy. You know, he's very generous with me. Um, he probably won't remember my lupin for him, but, you know, he's a nice guy, you know, and he's not, he's not the person you would think that's behind, you know, long-term capital. Um, I don't know that we talked about trading of the markets, but I watched their behavior. How did they act? You know, how did they act around me? How did they act around other people? At Quaker, you know, I caddied for the folks who at, then, at that time uh, owned Doral. Um, I caddied for, you know, I don't know how much I can say because I want to betray their trust. Sure. But uh, I guess I can say it now because he's retired. But the number two guy, it was then called Gulf and Western, was Stanley Jaffe. Sherry Lansing's former uh, producing partner was a great guy. Not much of a golfer. We used to, used to say if you got Stanley, you'd see the whole course because he was all over the place. But he, he too, was a nice guy. A guy named uh, Martin Davis was a great guy. There was a lot of really good guys who were successful in business, and they were down to earth, and they were humble, and they, they seemed very, very grateful for the things that they had in life and that success in business could afford you. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, there were a couple of people who were just really not that nice, and I realized, like, that is never how I want to be. And I would never speak to people that way. Like, I don't care if you're shining my shoes or you're collecting the garbage or, you know, if if you're – a successful business person in town, for me, I just treat everybody the same. Yeah. And so I think, you know, it's a, the answer is a little bit of both, I guess, you know. Well, and the reason I ask is, you know, you brought up ego a little bit and, you know, males with their ego in the trading world. And, and I've known very few but a handful of female traders who probably were some of my best mentors. And that's why I took the right. name. That's why I took my Twitter handle. And I've talked about this numerous times. But at Miss Trade is I want to trade with the patience and diligence of a woman. But. You know, uh, again, the respect also, and, and, and you know, I, I don't mean this uh, flippantly either. I think, you know, I would love to teach my daughter how to be a trader because I think temperament-wise, women are better suited to make uh, more rational decisions when it comes to trading and less emotional. And I know that sounds strange and 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 uh, to, to a lot of people, you know, people think women aren't emotional, but I think when it comes to money, for some reason, and keeping square, women are less emotional when it comes to trading, finances, politics even, than males. Right. So that's, I, 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 I guess that's really why I was asking you, when you, when you caddy, because when I caddied for women who, who were the wives of these powerful men, and I grew up in Detroit, same type of thing, it's like, you know, you could tell a lot about the guy by the wife he was married to, and and, and vice versa. Um, you know, maybe mm. the, you know maybe some of the individuals that I caddied with who were real jerks were were really married to women that you know probably didn't suit them well because they weren't as powerful or strong. Whereas the men who were humble and had that humility were married to great women typically, uh, and and. And so take that where you want, but I was just curious, you know, you're, you're, you know, I dedicate the book to my parents and I think that's where it comes from. If you're a jerk, not you, Matt, but if someone's a jerk, they usually have to be taught how to be a jerk. And I, I, I blame that on the parents, you know, there's a point where sure, you know, I live in LA and you can say, you know, Lindsay Lowen's parents were complete morons and I can assure you they are both of them, Dina and Michael Lowen. But then there's a point where you become an adult that, you know, you can't blame your parents anymore. And you have to kind of stand up, look in the mirror and say, OK, I got to clean up my act and figure out which way is up here. 
because uh, I don't get to blame my parents. Unfortunately, though, they carry that forward with them. So if a guy's married to a jerk wife, you know, he's probably a jerk. Right. Um, and and they, you get what you pay for, you know? I mean, <laughs> in marriage and in divorce. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, couple things I want to touch on. You, you, you say you say here in your book, all feelings are good when they teach you about yourself. Yep. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Comment on it is like, you know, okay, so if you don't like the feeling of taking, uh, you know, big losses, the lesson that it's trying to teach you is maybe to trade smaller or trade a contract that is less volatile or right. – in some cases, like, for example, with gold right now, with the ATR, the 20-day ATR at, say, I don't know, 45, 50 bucks, you know, you're looking at $5,000 of volatility, directionless volatility that you're going to see. And that's just – that's the temperament. That's the behavior of the contract. And so the contract doesn't know whether you're long or short. The contract is just being $50 volatile every day. Right. Okay, so then you say, well, that's too much for me, and even trading on one lot is too big. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. So you scale down and you look at the minis and you say, well, that still is too volatile. And you say, OK, well, now I'm going to go trade 20 shares of the GLD. And so you can use that feeling of the whipsaws in your account to help steer you to a, a way to have exposure to gold, but in a way that doesn't freak you out emotionally. Right. Most people look at their emotions as being negative, And if they have to speak about their emotions, especially the ones that deal with surrender, um, you know, fear or sadness, right? Right. Um, guys don't like to talk about that when it comes to trading because it, they feel that those are character traits that do not serve them. But in, in fact, they actually are the ones that are driving their systems probably more than anything. Right. I have found in my own life that even when I'm angry, I really don't have a lot to get angry about. Thank God I'm healthy. I got, I got everything going on. And when I do get angry, or at least when I did in the past, it was usually to mask fear or sadness, you know, and now I just – Embrace those feelings because, A, you process them faster and get them through you, and you end up learning a lot more. If you get angry over every little thing, you end up doing something destructive or you end up turning the, turning off the people around you that you actually want to be near. Right. So, you know, being more evolved as a man or more right. self-aware as a guy serves you on so many more levels uh, if you're just willing to feel those feelings and see what they're trying to teach you. Another thing you talk about in the book that I'm a big proponent of is taking time off from trading. Sure. Speak, speak to that a little bit. You know, do you have a regular schedule that you try to live by? Do you, know, do you trade certain days? Do you take certain times a year off as a, as a re regular thing? And then do you have you know, a point where you, you know, your drawdowns get to a point where you walk away or your upside gets to a point and you walk away? It's a lot of, lot of different ways people take a break, but I, I agree with it. You have to take mm -hmm. a break. Yeah. All right. So my own personal style of trading, just to define it, is not systematic. Um, I've used systems before. I've built my own systems before. And they're great learning tools. But I find that the markets are living and breathing things. And the price moves so fast that uh, still relying on, like, tape reading and watching markets' reaction to certain news and events around the world tell me as much as I need to know. So that's how I trade these days. More like judo, you know, with the market, uh, you know, tape reading is kind of harder, harder these days with HFT, but I'm still, I'd say deep down, I marry the fundamentals, the technicals, and a lot of tape reading. That said, I am not in most markets most of the time. Um, I don't, like I got mentioned in uh, one of the papers this weekend, you know, volatility does not equal opportunity. And, you know, the quote was, when you've got gold, that's, making a hundred dollar hundred dollar range or as Ed Scotty used to call them long ruler days. Um, I am not interested in chasing that. You know, that is, you know, I am not gonna be the dog that chases every car off the porch. Um, that is is what rookies do and what amateurs do because they see the action. They want to go over there and start rubbernecking and watching the accident in the other lane. I am not drawn to the drunk uncle at the table when the volatility goes off the off the charts. I don't want to warm up to that person and hang out with them. I want to either throw them out the door, out the window, or certainly not be near them. And that's true for any type of social situation. If someone can't either handle their booze or handle a situation just because their emotions get the best of them, 
to me, that's that's not a situation I want to be involved with because it's uh, it doesn't keep a person grounded. Um, and usually watching them train wreck, I don't find the, the voyeuristic aspect entertaining. Yeah. Um, as I like to say, the best thing that ever happened to Britney Spears was Lindsay Lohan. And unfortunately, <laughs> that that seems to be a system that that rolls forward in L.A. Yeah. So. Um, I think I've answered your question. If not, you know, follow up. Well, do you, um, you, you, you know, I, I guess uh, I did have a just quick question on that. When, by the way, I, I like the drunken, uh, I always use the drunken uh, uh, guys from Topeka or the grandmother from Cleveland at the, at the, you know, at the $5 table in Vegas. It's the same thing. I don't want to play with those guys. Do you use yeah. those same type of stop outs? Like you said, I don't want to play at certain times. You don't want to play at certain times. And you've got that mm -hmm. fairly well defined. Do you find, and, and I found myself doing the same thing. In movies, books, music now, uh, you know, I'll give it 30 pages on a book. I'll give it 30 minutes in a movie before I'll stop out. I won't waste my time. And as you said, at this point in my life, I've got my core group of friends. And for you to break in is going to, you know, have to be pretty, pretty darn special at this point. So not that we can't have acquaintances, but there's only so much time to go around, especially when you have four kids and a wife and, and, and trying to, you know, manage a, a book of my own trading business. So my question right. to you is, do you, do you find yourself using time limits and stops in your personal life outside of trading now because of this surrendering? Again, I don't care what people think about me anymore. You know, I, I, I used to. I used to maybe when I was running money, and that was a totally – it's funny, you know, I'm, so I'm getting off track here, and I'll come back to the finishing you answering the question. But, you know, I, I used to read Pit, Pitbull by Martin, you know, by Schwartz, and, and reading that book thinking, you know, the same things that he did. You know, I want to be a big swinging dick. I want to manage more money. Billions of dollars will make me billions of money instead of just doing what I was good at, which was trading my own book. And so I've gone full circle. Trading my money and trading OPM is a lot different things. And I, you know, I had to live through it. Unfortunately, I, I got, uh, you know, I got margin called running a short biased fund in '06 by one of my largest invest investors, happy with the performance but wanting to take away his money to buy more real estate. And I just said, okay, you're, you're, you know, you're, I'm betting against you, and you're going, you know, but you want to take your money, so. My question to you, I guess, is are you using stops and time limits and other parts of your life outside of managing money? Yeah, I think that's a very insightful, uh, very, very insightful of you. And I would have to say, although I, I don't know that I can I can cite something specific, I would say that, you know, my trading is really part of who I am. It's not the other way around, you know. So it's probably fair to say that. I, st I don't want to say I stalk people, but yeah, I spend a lot of time, you know, if they say, you know, the carpenter measures twice and cuts once, I'm measuring 10, 12 times because I cannot get emotionally invested in the outcome of any relationship, any friendship, any social situation or any trade for that matter. Um, so I would say yes. Were you always a spiritual person? I think I always had an inner game going on. Like I always, you know, I always talk to myself. <laughs> Sometimes I talk back, shut up, not now. We're in an interview. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's a little, a little Robin so Williams. Little I Robin always Williams was reflective. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I was a cerebral kid growing up. And I, when I, even when I played sports, I played sports and I played positions where you had to have a good inner game. I was a center on the football team. We called audibles on the line of scrimmage. Um, I was a catcher in baseball. And I was a center iceman in ice hockey. So it was a, those were thinking man positions. You know, you, you know, you, no team in the postseason in baseball now has a weak catcher. They're all strong guys behind the plate. And if you look at Bradshaw, he had Mike Webster, you know, as his center, arguably the greatest center of all time. And you look at the teams that won all the Stanley Cups, you know, you had Brian Trottier four times in a row with, uh, you know, the Islanders. You had, uh, you know, Lidstrom with the Red Wings. Lindstrom with the Red Wings, but even like the great Montreal teams, they all had great center icemen, great playmakers. They also had great goaltenders, right? No one's going to win big in the uh, in the postseason without strong netminders. They had Ken Dryden and and uh, Bunny Larocque and and uh, Patrick Roy. But nonetheless, I always played those positions, and again, it was just randomness. Like um, I was like I was big as a kid, 
So I played offensive line, and then I had the quickness and the speed, and I had the mental capacity to understand that. And I'm not saying that that, that makes me better, but when you're a center, you kind of have to know everybody's blocking assignments because if the defense starts to stunt, your quarterback is going to be looking at the sky from his back. Right. You know, if if you don't if you don't protect you know the guard to guard region, so. You learn a lot from those experiences, like you're saying about caddying. Do you learn about trading from caddying, or did you learn more about being a man? And I say both. I also think about, you know, playing sports. You get your head kicked in. You got to come back Monday for helmets and shoulder pads, watch the films, and then Tuesday you go in full contact again. And you better work on your weaknesses because if not, they're only going to come back again. Same thing for trading. You can sit and say, well, I don't like the feeling of regret. I don't like the feeling of doing all this work, doing all this research, and I put the damn trade on, and then it goes against me. It betrays me. But I can't take the loss today because I'll be walking around the office like a kick puppy and everyone's going to think that I'm a moron. But to me, that's the type of trader who you would never trust with money. When I hear guys say, well, Maria, we don't sell until the fundamentals change. I'm like, wow, what a moron. Cisco's from 75 down to 15. You need a 400, 300 percent move to get back to break even. Fundamentals clearly changed. The price moved first. Fundamentals followed. And you're sitting there. How can you have any? I don't know. I, I have no integrity. There's no integrity in that type of a situation where you can't just buy and hold. Yeah, and don't what, tell me about Warren Buffett either because he's a con man. I mean, I, I love the guy, but I mean, at the end of the day, I will argue that as good as he is, he's still very, very lucky. So, and, all right, you brought up a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I agree with you. He's been lucky, and he, he used to be a hedge fund trader, but he's not a trader anymore. Now he does guaranteed deals only. So let's get that out of the way. He's a, we, takeo he's a takeover specialist yeah. who happens to be a value guy. That's like saying I grew up a Catholic, and I'm a commodity trader. Well, sure, Catholicism is probably part of my, uh, my, my makeup now, and he will always be a Graham and Dodd value guy. But that's like saying that he wears glasses and he lives across the street from his wife or whatever when he was married. I mean, those are just character traits. It doesn't, you know, he's a very weird guy as far as I can tell. Well, you know, I, I was just talking with another trader uh, at the close today. I said, you know, the, the true bottom in this market will be when Berkshire goes under. And, uh, uh, there, you know, I, I think, you know, again, not to be, uh, you know, dark here, but I think when Warren dies, you know, the stock will take – 10 to 30 percent haircut uh, just because of that. Um, yeah, I have those types of risks, you know, with uh, people who are, you know, Berkshire is, is arguably a personal brand on some level for Buffett right now. And if you're going to buy, you know, any of the Berkshire shares, you probably want to buy a life insurance policy on Warren as a as a bit of a put because um, you have a lot of risk despite the enormously talented people. That they have. But, yeah, I mean, conventional wisdom is emotional comfort food. That's what I say in the chapter. And you can read all the annual reports and Charlie Munger and John Bogle. But those guys are all, you know, that Pepperidge Farm wisdom right now. If you have blind faith in that, you're going to end up dead. You're going to end up dead and broke. So let me ask you, you know, that we've, you know, in our, let's say, collective 40 plus years in this business, we, we've gone through an anomaly period where, you know, buy and hold worked. And that's, you know, we both agreed. We both agree to agree that that has failed and will continue to fail. So, you know, you've got Wall Street out there uh, struggling to hold on to this buy and hold fallacy and, and still tons of investment and, in, you know, money guys, as you said, who are just nothing but asset gatherers clinging to the index model. How does it all fall apart? Because I think it's, you know, it's fraying on the edges already. And, and, and I think it's a good thing. It's a good thing that we have guys who truly can, you know, if they want to manage money. But we, we've got so much froth out there that this, you know, managing money to the index is a silly game. I mean, why give your money to somebody who's just trying to beat the S&P by 1%? Like you said, just buy the SPY and do it yourself. I mean, what's the point? By the time you pay your 2% so they can make you 2%, why bother? Yeah, I mean, you bring up a really good point, and here's my take on it. You know, if you have assets and you want to do estate planning, you definitely need someone to tell you about having an eyelid, um, irrevocable life insurance trust. You need to learn about long-term care. You need to learn about Section 529 plans. You need people to help you set up money purchase plans and otherwise. And... You know, if you're coming from a financially illiterate background, you definitely need to learn about diversification. But like I say in the book, diversification is risk reduction. It's not risk management. You still need to have that pew point where 
okay, look, I traded Cisco up and down all the way through March of 2000, and on the last trade I was in, I'm going to say, 77. It ran up to 82. It came back. I got stopped at 75, and that was my last trade in Cisco. Now, I had no idea. I had no idea that it was going to go down to single digits eventually in the early 2000s. Um, but again, it's because the only thing that you can control are the losses that you take. You have right. no idea that Apple's going to be a great company. You have no idea that – I remember when Google came out with their auction, people were like 85 bucks for what – things a piece of junk. And now they're all sitting back making believe they didn't say it. You know, again, asset allocation is great. It serves the business model so that I can go out and do the one thing that the broker dealers want you to do, which is F – O A G focus on asset gathering. Right. Think of a rat's backside. Whether you're in the Mundernet net fund, who would have known? You know that thing was a net net loss for everybody. And then they did something very sly and dark, and to me, borderline unethical by merging it with another fund to kind of take the performance off. Moreover, they used the same ticker, um, which yeah, again you, you I think the, is. You know the bitter irony of that whole Munder Net Net thing is it's a Detroit-based fund that was you know running money and high tech. You know, I'm sorry, I'm from, I'm from Detroit, so I can say that with uh, you know a little grin on my face. What'd you think of the game yesterday? Uh, you know, I'm happy. You got Verlander. Hopefully, he can win tonight, and we can uh, go up two to one over the Yanks. But uh, you know, I, I think this is Detroit's year. Uh, but we'll see. You know, Yankees. You can never. Uh, you know, they're they're obviously the the clear favorite, but. Two games left. Whoever wins the next first two games here, you know, takes it. But, uh, you know, you're probably a Yanks fan, die hard, I know, so. I'm not a Yankees fan. I mean, yeah, I'm a Yankees fan. Of course I'm a Yankees <laughs> fan. I grew up. I got, you're up there. You, can't you know, I got be. pinstripes running through my blood. I've got. Hey, you know, I understand that. It's like me with, it's like me with Michigan football and hockey and all those things. So I, I bleed maize and blue. So you don't have to tell. I understand that. Murderer's Row. What year? What year you got there? I can't see. Twenty-seven. That's a cool I picture. 20, I, I should get. 20, I should, you know. You know. Here's a ball. I, you know. I, I'll, I can get Row, it down, dude. but I've got a Denny McLean signed baseball here in my office, and it serves mm-hmm. a number of purposes for me. Mm-hmm. Denny McLean, last thirty-game winner, obviously in the major leagues, um, but also that's a big number. But also, famous Murderer's Row. It's Gary right here. There's the Bambino. It's uh, So, yeah, I'm a bit of a Yankees fan. But you know what? If I grew up down the street from you, trust me, we would have been, you know, at the games together, right? Absolutely. I mean, my mother's side of the family was from Boston, and my dad's side's from New York. So yeah. some of them rooted for the baseball giants when they were in New York and played at the polo ground. Yeah. Um, I was a Yankee fan, but, you know, you can just say safely that baseball in September, October in my house was like being in County Armagh, like it was Northern Ireland, because you had the Yankees Red Sox thing going on. Uh, yeah, well, you know, I like good baseball. I mean, I like good baseball. It's probably my favorite sport. So I'm, you know, the Yankees are good. They definitely reinvest a lot of the money into their team. Um but you know, I'm just a fan of really good baseball. I think it's a, it's a great it's a great sport. So, uh, not to get off topic and off what we're, we've been talking about in baseball, but you brought it up, Moneyball. What do you think? Have you seen yeah. the new? Have you seen the movie? I have not, and I really want to. I have the book, as I'm sure, um, but I have not seen the movie. I love the book. I think, you know, I think Lewis that was probably one of his best works. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm, I've heard good things. Um, anyways, it's interesting. I was reading an article over the weekend, ESPN magazine talk, or uh, Sports Illustrated actually was talking about how you know now everybody's using the statistical models. So you know, as you said, just like in trading, everything changes. You know, the more players you get in, clouding up uh, technical systems, they work until they don't work. So the same thing obviously is going on in baseball and. Uh, you know, that's what keeps probably guys like you and me invested in going in this game is that it is a game. And what may work as a strategy today will switch tomorrow. And that's what I love about and am passionate about when it comes to trading. But one of the things I want to kind of wrap up with here, Michael, is this quote that you had. You know, when a trader lacks emotional intelligence and has no inner voice to listen to, he is more of a philanthropist than a trader. Couldn't have said it any better. Well, you know, I say that having been one, right? I mean, these are things that I've had to live through. I don't want to sit and pontificate and say, 
these types of things because it'll give people the wrong idea. Like there were times when I didn't have a strong sense of risk management and I had to go through, you know, these various uh, stages of my career where I literally felt that way myself. So I'm not, you know, I'm kind of calling my own girlfriend ugly, so to speak, because I, I had to go through that. Um, yes, I mean, Ed Sakota would say in his Dr. Seuss like rhetoric, you know, all systems work until they don't work anymore. Buy and hold works until it doesn't work anymore. And, you know, we're coming to a head in that and that people are paying 100 basis points, 200 basis points a year for asset management. And all they're really getting is asset allocation. Um, why? Well, because the business model is be built still measuring three heuristics in the broker dealer community, which are new accounts, net new assets and commissions and fees. Right. I've written questions for the Series 7. I have been a training manager and a sales manager, and I can assure you there is not a single question in the space that deals with how to make people money. When yeah. you work inside a wirehouse, you're graded on three things, new accounts, net new accounts, net new assets, and gross commissions and fees. Performance and especially, most importantly, low drawdowns are not something that anyone is concerned with whatsoever right. Right. at all. So until you learn to have a good sell discipline, especially for your losers, you might as well be a philanthropist because the buy and holders are basically the ones who are endowing everybody else's trading gains. Yeah. You know, and if that's what they want to do, that's fine. I'm curious as to why people don't embrace market timing, not necessarily to trade momentum, which, you know, there are white papers out there that show. And Mebin Faber has a good piece on his blog. Uh, that shows that momentum is more important than asset allocation, but people don't use market timing to get out of their losers fast enough. Right, right. You know, forget about finding the next deal when you know that 40% of stocks either combined go bust or don't make any money. It's not a game of, of stock or security selection. It becomes a game of, of choosing or playing superior defense. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, it's like I always tell people, you can make you can make more money playing the dark side on the craps table, and I believe, and I this tends to favor my personality. I, I I make more money shorting anything. There's always something going up. There's always something going on. But I, right. uh, I find gravity to be more violent to the downside. So that's that's where I find more you know more of my opportunities. Well, but that's, statistics are. You know, the statistics are on your favor. I mean, if you look at the index, it'll show you that, you know, the, you know the time that it takes to make a 20 percent move, it takes one fifth the time to make that same corrective move down. So it does become somewhat Machiavellian in, in that regard, if you can time it right. Yeah, the only the only thing I will say is the timing. And, and I've taken some very uh, I've paid some very expensive tuition and I could speak to a couple of my names. So I want to ask you. Where has, you know, give me a specific expensive tuition cost that you had, you know, a, a trade that you learned from and, and, and move on from, let go. Well, um, not in the, right, so the chapter of the book is called My Tuition and it outlines, you know, three specific asset classes because I've traded, you know, and I do trade all different asset classes, although I'd say if I have an edge in anything, it's in commodity futures. Um, I would have to say in the early 2000s, it was the frustration of getting in, you know, getting in the beans, getting knocked out, getting in the beans. And then, like, finally, on the eighth attempt after losing arguably eight to 16 percent of my that was in my own account um, where I tend to trade the most aggressively. Um, and being in the trading tribe and looking it in the eye and being completely honest with that frustration, you know, you learn to take the frustration because that's part of your system. And it's about the process, not about the loss. And right. I was focusing on the losses. So, you know, I lost 8% just on beans alone. Right. But I ended up coming back. I made some money back, not all of it. But then that was when platinum and copper and gold started making their moves. So I ended up making money there. And then cocoa took off from 1500 to three grand. And, man, I must own 6% of the cocoa market at one time. And so it comes back, and then you look back and you say, okay, these are the lessons that I need to learn. And like you said, I think at the top of the show, that when you're a professional trader, losses are part of the business. Yeah. So get over it. Right. Get over it. Get over yourself. Business. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> well, I didn't want to say that because, again, people listen and they'll say, look, he thinks who the heck he is. But, hey. yeah, get over yourself. I mean, yeah. why do you think this, the thing is going to move in your favor? Because you have a position on it. If you're short, you think it's going to go down as a favor to you? Right. It doesn't care. Right. 
Doesn't give a rat's <laughs> ass. Does not. So, Michael, I've got to say, uh, again, a lot of people following your uh, blog already, Martin Chronicle with a K, K-R-O-N-I-C-L-E. And, uh, That's right, because I'm all hip hop and West Side. No, just, just <laughs> <laughs> two, two, <laughs> two former East East Siders have gone West Side. I love it. Um, but you're also giving a, uh, a master's class on the fourth of November. Tell us a little bit about that. That's back on the East Side. So. That's right. Actually, it's in Times Square, which I guess you could say it's it's part east. It's kind of like the central hub of all of the world on some level. So, you know, Victor Sprandy is one of my best buddies, and he and I are pretty close. And when you marry what he knows, he's like an encyclopedia of knowledge, right? He's the only guy to get a cold call from Soros to run money. He ran money for Luke Cooper, Leon Cooperman. And I think in 44 years of running money, he's had only like two down years or something like that. Ridiculously talented. It's really disgusting how talented he is. Right. But when you marry like the, the emotional and the trading tribe stuff that I can bring into the equation and you can marry it up with what Victor does in his own trading. Now, these are proprietary setups that he still uses. And mind you, he had a 70 percent month in January, which, yes, you have to be technically built for. But you also have to have the inner game to be able to receive that abundance and also make sure that you're quick to act to both take the profits and to move quickly when these things reverse on you. So we put a full day together, 12 hours. It's a master class. It's probably not built for the beginner. Um, it's meant for the intermediate trader probably who's lost some money and wants to find a quick way to – well, not a quick way. Wants to find a way to learn about the marriage between system and trader and technique. And ultimately, yeah, it's not priced for retail, but but what you end up getting is a lot of information on how to start your professional career and focus on the things that professional traders focus on saving you thereby a lot of time and potentially a lot of money by chasing your tail or going out and buying other stuff that has no efficacy. Yeah. I like it. I like it. And I've got to say again, get this book. I don't care if you've been trading for uh, one day or 25, 30 years. This is going into my top three. I would recommend it to anybody, and I really mean that. And uh, my other two, I would say, are Pitbull by Schwartz and – when super traders meet kryptonite, those are uh, and I'm going to throw inner voice of trading into my top three now. It's that big. Wow, I love it. That's quite that's saying that's saying something. I appreciate that. I'm very humbled. It's uh, book was enormously difficult to write. Um, I could have easily gone way into the yoga and meditation part and made it so granola that no one would want it. No, but then it would have lacked integrity and genuineness. And you know that was just the way that it worked for me. For Mike Bellafiore, it was running the big loop in Central Park with no music on. For Steve Spencer, it's like me standing on his head and rotating in yoga. Um, everyone does it a different way, and the idea is to find a way that works for you. And it's just as good as anything else that's out there. So, thank you, Matt. You've been very generous with your time, and uh, I appreciate you taking an interest in me and my book. Thanks, Michael. Again, good success to you, and I'm sure it will uh, sell well. Look for it on Amazon. It's already number 19 on all investment books. That's pretty amazing in less than a week's time, so keep up the good work, my friend. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, thank you for your time.